So historically, probably the first uh, way to make Python faster, that was at a time where computers were even much slower than they are today, um, was called numeric. And actually, one of those libraries that probably got a lot of computer scientists interested finally into scripting at all. So, and, uh, and it divided the scripting community a little bit. There were the people doing Perl, uh, which kept to Perl because Perl was much better equipped for string processing as was uh, something you had to do if you were in web programming. And there were those people now discovering whether they can do programming actually a little bit faster and more convenient by using a scripting language. And they tried to put their numerical codes uh, into Python code. And as they hit some obstacles to make it uh, interestingly performance-wise, they uh, programmed something where the computation itself did not use Python as it is. So why is Python slow? Python is mainly slow because it is flexible. You can do everything in Python with, as an interpreted language. It will even allow you to do things like self-modifying code, having arbitrary types in all types of containers and the like. In many numerical applications, you don't really need that flexibility. So you only use a fraction of that flexibility that Python has to offer. And you would easily be willing to trade some of that flexibility for speed. And that's exactly what numeric and then it's, uh, which is a pre one of the predecessors of NumPy um, were doing. So, NumPy is not within the standard package of Python, so it's a separate package, it's a library, and it does computation in C, more or less. So, and so what you get is some C library that has a very Pythonic uh, way to be included into your Python code. That means what you give up is the, some of the type flexibility in Python. So in NumPy, you work typically with some either implicitly or explicitly typed arrays. And uh, the second thing is you try to get a more vector-based programming style. So you do, try to do away with loops or list comprehensions, which are some kind of uh, one-line loops. So if you start, so you should see some number, uh, hopefully above 1.10, something like that. Um, I don't know what it's on pit stain. So uh, this was on my notebook, maybe because you are working on Jurica, the number may be slightly different, doesn't matter. Um, at least those differences on Nothing I will talk about in this course. So what you're typically working with in NumPy are numerical data. Yeah? NumPy is nothing that you would use in order to process text data typically, unless you're doing very strange things with text. And, um, so, and the main data structure is called an ND array, so an n-dimensional array. And, uh, if you don't say anything, then typically, depending on how you create it, but the typical type that is assumed by NumPy is a float64, at least on the systems you are typically working at. So nevertheless, for, in order to be, let's say, efficient on the amount of memory you, you spend for your data structures, it has uh, a so-called minimal data type convention. That's to say, if you are constructing your arrays from data, then it may be that it will try uh, whether it can't uh, fit a smaller data type than float64 in order to keep those data, and it will do so. And this has a couple of consequences, good ones and bad ones. 
Why doesn't it work the way it should? That is okay. So um, you can create. This is a odd slide here. You can create these type of ND arrays by various ways, uh, and and some of them are listed here and are in the notebook, and you will execute them and see what that gives you. There are some that are quite basic, so converting lists or multidimensional lists into arrays, which is a very natural thing to do as long as the sublists uh, have the same length. Otherwise, uh, that is difficult to interpret as an array. Um, on the other hand, you can have some convenience functions uh, like you typically also have in, in other languages to produce uh, arrays filled with zeros or ones, um, filled with uh, some series of numbers, um, those things. You may, as you, you cannot uh, assume arbitrary data types to be able to put into such ND arrays. Uh, you may be also interested in doing, uh, getting some idea on what is my current array uh, keeping as data or how large is my current array in bytes. And there are a couple of uh, introspection ways you can uh, uh, do. In particular, um, you, can, you will very often work with a shape which gives you more or less uh, the dimensions um, and, and the size of each of the dimensions. Uh, but also it can give you the item size in bytes or um, other introspection uh, variables. The data types you can hold, um, they are, for one ND array, they are typically uniform. So that is the underlying assumption to allow for an efficient memory layout of these structures. And the standard memory layout of um, arrays is C style, not Fortran style. So it's uh, that the innermost uh, dimension is the smallest one. So, and uh, in particular, uh, NumPy also allows you to have some special data types, like, for example, complex numbers. So, directly. Uh, uh, supports complex numbers and it supports uh, date times and time delta um, uh, structures uh, that are interpreted and calculated uh, the correct way. So if you do something in which is, let's say, not, cannot be interpreted as one of these basic data types, then you will end up with something that is of type object. And this is a compound uh, um, data type that has a certain signature to it, but where you cannot apply most of the NumPy functionality to. Uh, does not work. So, yeah, here's support for complex numbers. So you can have the complex conjugate. You can uh, create this uh, angle argument, the cosine argument. So as you are within a fixed type data structure, you have to watch out because uh, in contrast to compiled languages, it does something uh, that's called type coercion. So it is kind of an implicit type conversion, type downcasting. And that is something um, which goes without any warnings. So if you try to put a float value into an array that is integer, then it will become an integer. So and uh, uh, it will just truncate it. So it will not even round it. It will just truncate this value. <clears throat> Python then tells you better explicit than implicit. So it is, uh, there are a couple of typecasting functions you can use if you know what you're doing or what your data are like. So you can 
convert your data between data types. And you will see some of the casting examples. So you can put everything there. You can cast to everything more or less. And you will see that it does not always make sense. If you are in a field where you have, for example, categorical values uh, or text values or whatever, um, and those are record-like, like those things you typically have in a record from a database, then you might better uh, might be better off with pandas. Yeah? So pandas has also a lot of uh, functionality that it, uh, to some extent, even borrows from NumPy. Um, but it is uh, meant for working with record-like uh, data and has a lot of convenience functions for those. So sometimes called the Excel for Pythoners. So uh, um, I think that's not quite fair. But uh, if your data is something that you typically have in a database or more in Excel sheet fashion and you're not doing only numerical computing but rather data wrangling like grouping or uh, those things, then uh, it's rather pandas that you are probably looking for or something that uses pandas, which I will come to tomorrow, I think. So uh, the main difference, if you are familiar with uh, Python data structures um, or Python lists, in the uh, indexing is that you use a single square bracket there, not one for each of the dimensions. And that you can use a lot of uh, interesting ways to index those things besides the typical slicing you use on lists. So you can either give explicit um, values for the indexing, but you can also have uh, a boolean constructed on site within the square brackets or evaluated within the square brackets um, to define a condition. You can also um, give an evaluated uh, boolean condition just as an array of booleans uh, to mask your array. And what you also can do is you can store um, Boolean conditions and then use them later on to index your uh, array to get certain values out of your array. You can write um, to several values, even several dimensions at once. So you see that here in an example. So here you have the, have the second, uh, um, uh, second row and the, uh, everything from the second column on that you are writing uh, into. And the value you are writing into that is 0. And you see that it does exactly that. So the second row, the columns two and three, also columns one and two by, by Python indexing are zero. It is an ND array, so you have arbitrary uh, number of dimensions, although I have never used more than four. So, um, and uh, what may be interesting is the layout in memory of these arrays. And you can see how this is arranged or how they access this memory by giving the strides uh, attribute. Uh, the strides attribute tells you how many bytes uh, is between successive elements in your array in each of the dimensions. So in this case, you see you have in the <coughs> From value to value, you have eight bytes, because it's a float64 array in this case, obviously, or an int64. Probably that should be an int64 array. So you have eight bytes here um, in order to get from one to two and from two to three. And you have 24 
bytes you have to skip in order to get from the one row to the next one. So, and very often, for example, if you do a transpose, if you uh, do some reshaping, it rather alters these type of strides, so the way you're accessing the memory, but not um, the memory itself. So it can do so without really uh, having to copy the array in order to uh, access it in a different way. Whoop, what's this? Okay. So I think I'll skip that one because most of the people are familiar. So if you want to get data in, um, besides you, uh, functions that create your data, um, you can also load data from text uh, or from binary files. And uh, the load text uh, and there's this gen from text, they include some basic uh, parsing ability. So they can, if you have some data where you want to skip some rows or columns or have a certain, um, some comment lines or something like that, there's a limited functionality in there uh, that you can do that at loading time so you don't have to massage your input uh, data necessarily beforehand. Uh, if you're doing this with some HPC in mind, that's to say you're going to load couple of 10,000 files at the same time and want to parse them at the same time, I uh, do not recommend to use these functions. Um, there are better ways to do that. One uh, is pandas, because in contrast to those parsers, they have uh, parsers that are coded in C, so work behind the scenes, whereas this one is an explicit Python parser. and therefore is a little bit, well, about 20 to 50 times slower. And uh, there are also some ways to then use this in order to create directly distributed arrays. And we will, if we discuss a little bit about the features of Dask, which we will do tomorrow, then you will see that they also have uh, ways to efficiently work with thousands of files. Uh, and that may be the preferred way if you do that. But if you have binary format data, so uh, there's a spe there are two special formats for, for NumPy uh, data that you can use to efficiently store and retrieve uh, NumPy arrays to serial serialize them. You can also access HDF and NetCDF files in Python, but this is not a functionality of NumPy. So you So why is NumPy fast? Fa NumPy is fast because it does things in a vectorized way. So it does not really produce for each and every value in an ND array a Python object and then operates on that Python object, but it operates on the ND arrays in a vectorized way behind the scenes. It can even, if it's appropriately set up, it can use all the threads you have on your CPU. It can use fast math, li uh, math libraries, like the uh, Cray has probably some math library that can be linked to. Uh, we use the Intel MKL library, and you will see within the notebook uh, that you can uh, have a look how your NumPy is configured and whether it uses these fast libraries or not. So. You will do the time comparison for yourself there. And uh, it's, of course, that you cannot only add uh, some scalars to, to these arrays. Uh, you can do a lot of different mathematical operations in this vectorized way. Uh, currently, there are more than 80 functions available. Um, they should uh, cover most of what you need. And there are some uh, things that may be a little bit more sophisticated that are not directly in NumPy. There is a companion package called SciPy, which implements a lot of uh, uh, other um, numerical um, procedures using the NumPy functions.
one of the things that makes it convenient to uh, work with uh, these arrays without copying and there is a uh, functionality called broadcasting. So um, if you see the first arrays, you have a two-dimensional array and then you have a one-dimensional array. So if you want to get the maximum of those, it normally wouldn't make sense directly. So uh, implicitly or behind the scenes, it will be assumed that this uh, one-dimensional array can be broadcast, that to say more or less it can be iterated several times, uh, the number of uh, dimensions that are missing uh, will be added. So they will, behind the scenes, this one-dimensional array will become a two-dimensional array with the same content, of course, uh, not with zeros or ones or something like that filled. And then it makes sense to apply this function maximum to these two two-dimensional arrays. If you are working in HPC, you're probably familiar with uh, collective me uh, methods. So um, NumPy supports typical reduction and accumulation functions they can use here. And um, it would be, of course, logical to assume um, that it would be nice to have a facility where you can write your own function as a ufunc, as a vectorized function, then to apply to these ND arrays. Does that work? Yes. Does it work with NumPy? No. So NumPy provides you with a way to turn your procedure into something that works on ND arrays. So you can apply it as a normal ufunc, but what it does is it just calls that function uh, in, a, in a respective loop yeah, so you just save more or less the loop iteration itself, but it's not that uh, your function has been really turned into uh, a fast math function like the ones that are built into, uh, into NumPy. There is a namesake. It's also called Vectorize in a different package, number, which we will introduce to you in some depth, um, that can actually do what you would assume that uh, NumPy should do if you call a, a vectorize function. So uh, bottom line, don't use NumPy vectorize, but there is some other vectorize that will serve the same purpose. And I think that is what you need to know. And those people who are not familiar with NumPy at least should execute the notebook and have a look into those things. There's a little bit more than I've talked about in the notebook memory interface and those things, and uh, maybe even people uh, with a cursory familiarity of NumPy may find something new in these notebooks. So I think, how many minutes do we give them? Yes.